Hello there, everyone, and thank you for rejoining me here in TNO, the lasses of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Ukraine Lover, but we gotta talk about the people's truths. The slums of Cherkasy lie at the crossroads in the Reich's Commissariat, firmly under German control. Though not as important as a city such as Kyiv, it lies at the intersection of all three major resistance groups, with native Ukrainians here oscillating between hope and despair, with any resistance organizing historically falling apart due to ideological disputes or a heavy German response. So all too ironic, then, the city was chosen as a meeting place for the besieged fire talks between the UNRA and the UASSR, in an abandoned pre-war warehouse on the outskirts. The two delegations cautiously approached each other, and after minutes of security checks and padding down, the talks began. The UNRA delegate offered a handshake, to which the USSR delegate turns down. No need for formalities, there are urgent matters to discuss, the meeting's already off to a rocky start. Now letting the communists get the first demand in, the UNRA delegate speaks right. As we both know, the occupation will soon crumble under the weight of happenings back in Germania, until then, I believe it would be best in our interests, all of our best interests, to focus our resources on the forces of the uh, enemy, namely the Germans and the UPA instead of each other. The USSR delegate responds, our organization's interests are diametrically opposed, so no promises can be made, however. It would only be logical for the USSR to focus on the forces of uh, the Germans for now, seeing as they oppose a serious threat. The backhanded insult is not lost on the UNRA delegate, though he has already gotten what he wants. As they walk away from the meeting, he whispers his compatriot, this won't last long, as we have a promise. And a couple of Earl Grey tea to drink. The leader of the supposedly superior uh, <clears throat> Elrian race lies on his deathbed. As his health falters, his tendrils retreat from Ukraine. Those in the West have already ready to fight for the freedom and make the most of the approaching opportunities. Horlis will prepare a speech to rally supporters of a free and democratic Ukraine. He'll promise free and fair elections and that they will be as held as soon as possible once Ukraine is liberated from um, German and Soviet control. We won't use authoritarian tricks like temporary dictatorship or the election being guided. Ukraine must be truly free once it's liberated. It will be. It has to be. So right now we're doing this. 76%? Not bad. Uh, Bearing Council, huh? Well, we're not going to see or get that far enough to see how good or bad it happens to be. So I don't like that. 73%? Make it better. There you go. That's better. We got the political power. So we did sabotage grand production, we are disrupt resource extraction, all sorts of good stuff, you know. But then we gotta talk about the anthem of the liberated. The clock chimes and Ukraine will rise. Germany ails under its own weight and the Reichs Commissariat crumbles and cocklays on his deathbed. Never since the days of 1917 have we found ourselves with such a firm chance for national liberation, from what we can tell. With many garrisons currently either dissolving in light of Germany's effective collapse or struggling against many of the other partisan movements taking the initiative, it is clear that the time to rise is now or never. Bodo Bodovitz's Ukrainian National Revolutionary Army has already begun the preliminary actions of rising up once the general government falls, and Odloblin's government in press is mobilizing at this very moment. Before long, Ukraine will be free, and we'll play our hand in bringing down the Rex Commissariat, whether we live or not to see it. Cool. Screaming for freedom is next. But soldier citizen, Yuri Horlis sat at the head of the table, accompanied by his staff and trusted associates. Oh, there goes that guy. In front of the Great Dining Hall, the crowd before him represented various aspects of Ukrainian society and her people, all gathered to celebrate the announcement of the Provisional Constitution, as the wine begins to pour Horlis to the stage. It's not a man's place to stand above another to lord over his fellows with false authority and sense of entitlement. Occasionally, a few men are asked to stand in front of the crowd, leading the civilization forward into the unknown, yet even then. Such men must understand that they are no different from these those behind them, and they too will fall back to be led by another. The, uh... <clears throat> Nazis, communists, and other despots have failed to understand this inher nature inherent to society, and as a result, have crafted a brittle kingdoms held together only by moments of misplaced belief. History has punished others for such transgressions, and shall do so again, you, my brothers and sisters. See, through the illusion, the storm is coming and only our fortress will stand in the end, as they have built their walls of fear and hate. Ours are held by respect and faith. The applause felt sincere to Horlis, and as he could feel the people's belief in what he was saying before announcing the main course, he decided to reveal his primary message for the night. And I swear to show my allegiance to both the people and the Constitution. But once Ukraine is free, I will retire from public life. The elections that ensure our rise will be free, fair, and open. The law of the land will be upheld. And from the simple farmer, all the way to Congress, the gleam in their eyes radiated hope. Oh, look at that. I love how divided we are here. Oh, it's so good. Nothing like extreme division. Free the enslaved, huh? Yeah, that wouldn't be bad, but... It's alright. We gotta have a sip of tea here. It's probably really hot, though. It's alright, the game's lagging really hard for the Germans to kill themselves, too. Ah, nothing like a good old German civil war. It's pretty normal. Things explode. 
all the time. 72% is not good enough. Keep baiting down the Ukrainian insurgent army, and there goes France. Goodbye, France. Happy November, everybody. It's going to be a great year for us. Or at least, for the last two months of 1963 will be. There'll be a lot of dead Ukrainians, unfortunately, but, you know, it's a give and take here. And there oh, goes the nation to the north. Rex Commissariat Austin is going kaboom. Pretty normal. Word was just sent around each factory, plantation, every other jailhouse that Ukrainian slaving away within its walls. There would never be a nice, a better time. Each of these places was marked as a low priority for the jackboots, finding themselves resigned, reassigned to put out fires all across the Rex Commissariat. For Marco, it was time to start a fire of his own. Each day he slaved away from under the gaze of his overseer, a miserable bootlicker content to kiss the ring of anyone above him, for those below him. He was a stereotypical fascist who gave no reprieves, making liberal use of his slugs to dissent, silence dissent, no matter how minor, the dissent could no longer be silenced. Marco clocked in early for work as he peered up at his overseer, screaming down the phone for more men while he walked to his station. The screaming a steam whistle signaled the start of the strike instead of heralding more stolen labor. Hammers bang, beginning his discordant noises before slowly forming one continuous beat as a unifying voice screamed, Death to fascism, freedom to the people. The overseer tried to call for up and no one answered, except for Marco and the five others marching up to him with hammers. Racing back to his office, he tried to search for something that could persuade them to spare him. Nothing would save him, even if he spent an eternity crafting the perfect combination of words that could absolve Judas himself. The officer's glass shattered onto the floor as the men walked into the office. He attempted to cry out in a pitiful plea before he was stung with a sharp pain in his chest as his vision darkened, fading away as a prelude to the unfinished revolution of 1917. A scene repeated a hundred times all over Ukraine. Battle lines. Reports were now spilling off faster than the Rex Commissar's staff could read them, but they all presented the same image of a worsening situation growing wildly out of control. The violence in Volynia had spread far and wide across the rest of Ukraine, with the many a city and town in such anarchy that the authorities were requesting military intervention to break up the riots, unfortunately for them. The military was occupied and they got nothing but the drugs even as the fires rose higher in the west. Instead, troop convoys traveled with stilted haste towards Volynia. What had once been an intelligence black hole was now the undisputed territory of the UPA, whose troops were emerging to meet the growing response. Sources told that they had pushed from Volynia to Zhidomir, painting the great lands with flame and blood before long the rioting populace was under the control and communication lines had gone silent, abruptly ending a death rattle of urgent cries for help that could not be adequately answered. And the burning cities in Ikchuar soaked fields, battle lines were forming, from the lowly soldier digging into the mud to the general scanning reports, they all knew this was a turning from an insurgency to civil war. Refugees crossed these lines, despite the scorched fields and the cracked roads, patrolled by hateful soldiers, or roadblocked by bitter steel and sandbag walls. The growing volume and frequency of gunfire did little to deter them, Ukrainian or German. Neither army was making much distinction in their drive to form a front line before the situation could escalate. The most determined and shaken immigrants were Germans, who also reported only further violence in their tales of the fall of Hedewald, the colony to the UPA. They painted a grim picture of the fate of the colony, both haunted tales of violence and the dead and mutilated they brought with them. These stories only breathed more panic into the entirety of Ukraine, and it turned more violence. And there's the Ukrainian state, which is partly owned now by uh, these guys down here. The dispirited deranged uh, Domboy, atrophied Azdia, Azdia, scars of the second struggle. Oh boy. The Brothers' War, interesting. Green Civil War and Revolutionary Inertia, so. It's interesting that what they got here in total. But where do we go come in from? Onward to liberation. Uh, the announcement had gone well in Yuri Horlis's estimation. He did derive some satisfaction from imagining the impotent rage Leibrandt, uh, or whatever German dog the Nazis had installed after Koch was experiencing right now. No doubt, the idea of Ukrainians rising up to expel the foreign invaders was an unfathomable concept to them, or at least it had been. The crowds at Ternopil had roared and cheered as he and Taras Boloba Borobets publicly declared the Republic of Ukraine and called up upon the nation to rise up and join them. Several things had happened in the quick succession following their unveiling to the nation. They quickly gained the support of Oloblin, as well as fully seized Venetia after some brief skirmishes. In a matter of days, they established themselves as firm opponents to the false government, gained momentum politically and publicly, and were well positioned for the war to come. This was all the easy part, though. Yuri knew very well things were not fully in their favor, while the Germans still had lost authority with, across vast swaths of Ukraine. They still have many of the cities, as well as the German settler populated rural regions. They were certainly weakened, but they were definitely not helpless or incapable of responding. Much of what happened next depended on how well the Nazis were able to organize themselves. With any luck, they would tear themselves apart trying to vie for power in Cox's absence. Otherwise, he would need to rally as much support, men, and resources to the Republic. There were going to be many long and sleepless nights ahead, but much such was the reality now. They were committed to the liberation of Ukraine. No turning back. So, oh my god, this is sucks. Why do we split like this? Oh my god, this is... Oh, we're going to break through here as fast as we possibly can. That's not ideal. Very bad. Very, very bad. It's a war hero. Well, it's going to have to be a war hero for what we're going to do here. 
And, uh... So we're gonna take you guys. No. I guess you have to do this, like that. E5, literally just hold here. The rest of y'all. Out here. And entrenchment speed. Here we go. If anything, can we build a radar station? Oh, we, would, oh, we, oh, we built one in. Ah, we built it in literally the best area. We have intelligence on them, but a republic from the ashes. Friends and patriots of Thomas now, just as in 1917, are countries beset by German invaders, traitors, and Soviet oppressors. And once again, the time has come for our national struggle for freedom and justice. We cannot fail as we once did, for the stakes have never been higher. Because defeat here does not merely mean the yoke of foreign devils with suppression of Ukrainian self-determination. It can spell the end of Ukraine and her people at the hands of slavers and butchers. We will not go quietly into that good night. We will fight, persevere, and prevail. Long live Ukraine. What do we got here? Oh, we still have all of this stuff. We, do we still have to deal with this stuff, man? Bruh. God, I hope not. Get base war support. We got a lot of stability, though. Uh, I guess we'll go with that one for now. Look at parties. Parties getting worse. We got a lot of socialism. Ivan Ziuba. Vasil Astus. Portalus. Interesting. Extremely high deficit and negative real growth, huh? Well, we don't want any negative growth, so. It is what it is. What do you have? Foreign supply bases. Not yet perished, that's good. Brothers War, of course, pretty normal. Uh, Ukrainian Civil War. And revolutionary inertia. Interesting. I'm gonna wait a day. Do this, do this. There you go. Ah. Oh, we still have that here. Uh, we're gonna definitely do this one. Free military factories, guns, definitely. Support equipment and at artillery. Throw in the anti tank. Uh, motorized would be important. Steam locomotives, I guess. Jet casts. Don't think it'll really matter in the end, but whatever. So, I'll scramble the forces. Scrap to the pipeline. That'll be pretty good to do as well. For the war, the smuggling routes between Ukraine and Muscovy were enormous. That has changed dramatically since the uprising and tight lockdown of the border. Such pressure has shattered the network centralization as profiteers of all straps are selling to both sides. This cannot continue. We'll crush these bandits, seize the ill-gotten gains, and put them out of business for good. Not only will this allow us to acquire much needed supply, but it will further prove the righteousness of our cause. The operation begins now. We're going to save first. But guys, you never know how things are going to work in the end. We've not got any real command power. Almost no political power. And we have a sympathier. Some sort of red berry. Something like that, I don't know. Um, as soon as the war starts, we are we are bomb rushing as hard as we can here. There we go. Oh, we actually got more territory. Look at that. Um, do your best to defend here. I need you guys to assault. Okay, what? No, get stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Get some help. Seriously. Bruh. You move in as hard and as fast as you can. You move in as hard and as fast as you can. You're going to go here and get all the way to there if you possibly can. You're going to go there too. I want you to just focus, like, taking the tiles. Take tiles, take tiles, take tiles. When I play as these guys, it looks like it's probably going to be pretty darn difficult. Just go here. It's fine. Go here. Beautiful. Exactly what we need and want. Let's go. That'd be great. Uh, go there. Hey, prototype anti-air is gone. Nice. 
If we can do this, we can focus on only one front at a time, which would be fantastic. But that's going to take a little bit more time than I would probably like. There we go. Beautiful. Up out. They're definitely attacking us. Uh, just wait there first. You need some reinforcements there. Beautiful. They're in, so I'm going to send you guys down here. Hopefully that'll be enough to do that. You guys go there. Well, that's not going to exactly work for us either. You know what? You go there. My bad. What do we got here? We got these soldiers. Oh, we need 30 political power for this. 0.62 is not really great, but whatever. There we go. Crippling ghosts. So many words, they are like crippled ghosts, muttered Vesiostus. He knew that it was silly quoting himself, but the words felt right. He had no photo in hand, the face of his father. One picture really couldn't capture the man's spirit. Words couldn't capture the essence of his life, even to the one perhaps most qualified to look tempted. Even Stuss, a poet and dutiful son, cannot capture the nuances of a life lived across all the changes of the 19th and 20th centuries. Stuss knew he wasn't that different. He'd been born in a Soviet, grew up in the Rock's Commissary, and was now fighting in the anarchy of civil war. Was every Ukrainian doomed to watch Ukraine go from one form of uh, suffering to another? He couldn't remember much of the Soviet other than knowledge passed down in books and stories, and there was a time to which he should not return. His memories from then were instead of a blur of chaos and bloodshed that he scarcely understood a child's perspective of war. He remembered the Reichs Commissariat all too well. Life had changed so quickly from war to choking oppression, where he nonetheless fell in love with Ukraine. All these changes were brought him here, the ultimate battlefield of change, war, something he grew to know well from the banned books he scrounged up in little wars of his youth. That was the first time his words were not treason, so in the lamplight of his command post, he tried to write something for his father, a man who represented such change as Stuss. He sent out his words to soldiers to fight those battles, yet he knew there was no way to put all this on paper. Outside the dark hues, of night where his father hid, had seeped into Ukraine's blue skies and died in pitch black. Perhaps we should uh, remain in this affliction's mire, lest he lose more of the night. Instead, he stood up and left his post. It was dark enough that he could see the colorful, translucent ribbon of the Milky Way. Maybe tonight, he didn't need words. After all, they are like crippled ghosts. Scraps of the pipeline. Uh, there are came many collaborators. These men discarded their honor for many reasons. Career advancement, fear of their own safety, and the safety of their families. But most never thought they'd be at open war with their fellow countrymen. It would be a shame to not use some of these reluctant collaborators to our own advantage, or Alexander Olovlin can bring us many collaborators, uh, Reichs Commissariat Police Units, and they're totally invaluable to our cause. Of course, many of the UNRA may not be pleased with this, but so be it. Get to there in advance. We're going to do hopefully very well here. Looks like we are. Hey, and a circle mint. We'd like to see. Blow them all up, thank you very much. Doesn't take too much as long as everyone does it. The Macedonian War, nice. Can't wait till they get content too. Be the soldiers. Croatian winter, gosh. Taras Bolba Borovitz. Nice. Be offensive. We like them offensive. Be very offensive now. I'm not sure why you're retreating, but whatever. How are we doing on the front? We're actually doing extremely well. We almost completely destroyed the Ukrainian state. My god. I love it. Take all you guys that way. Algerian war. Nice. We took their last supply base. Beautiful. And we got rid of them. The Ukrainian state's already dead. That was really fast. Happy New Year. <laughs> This is going a lot easier than I thought it was, which tells me that that other Ukrainian collaborator state is going to be much more difficult to take out in the future. Or to play as in the future. The Commons are doing decently for themselves. Unfortunately, fortunately. Look, I scramble the forces. It has begun. Everything we have been waiting, fighting, preparing for that is now happening. And Ukraine is in flames. Not a moment must be lost. Orders will be sent along much generated lines and will march to war. It will not be easy or fast. All the soldiers and the volunteers will take time to organize into real fighting forces, and dispositions will need to be made to cover all the new, fluid fronts, but these challenges will be overcome. Ukraine will be free again, of course. 
It was never meant to be. Go, go, go. At the uh, officer's command. The UNRA soldiers entered a large compound that the UAP, UPA had built. They last up a patrol. Its fall would mean the end of the nationalist resistance, so they were expecting very hard resistance. The best men were assembled, the strongest howitzers were brought. Everything was prepared for the final battle of the war. However, to the surprise, all the UPA soldiers had abandoned those positions and no storm was needed. At first, it seemed like a trap, but as sections of the compound were cleared one by one, no resistance was met. The place was in disarray, guns scattered across the floor. The documents strewn about and so on, just like an abandoned military base should look, though this thought the soldiers and officers, the enemy fighters had truly left without a fight. After some time, a small group of UNRA uh, stormtroopers finally reached the deepest chamber of the compound. On the count of three, they busted through the door, of course. Uh, Shukiev, Chef, attempted to fire upon them, was struck down with a bullet wound to the chest. His son lunged towards the men in blind range, only to receive a rifle, but for his troubles as they marched down the Grand Vaz. Klyachivsky was sitting on a chair nearby with a gun to his temple and his right hand shaking. If Stetsko wasn't there, he must have fled with the others, but the soldiers didn't care. They wanted to get out of that place as soon as possible. Klyachivsky was taken away alongside Shukhechev. Shukhechev. And his son, and some after some time, while entries to the compound were sealed. Thus, the EPA met its end. We got some entertainment now, finally. Still. If we can get key, that'd be fantastic. A little red revolution in Greece, huh? We need to leave back. The mass is behind us. Ooh, Legacy 100. Uh, the, uh, though the Kultros cannot be said to have had the most powerful strike arm, it similarly cannot be denied that their masters are spreading information propaganda. The occupiers have never been able to stop getting the message to the masses, and this is still the case. By providing them additional funding and support, we can ensure that they aid the uprising in the still-occupied zone, spreading the message, and reminding those who may be undecided of the Republic that is to come. Yeah, perished, of course. Ukrainians of war. A bitter harvest, negligible. Okay. Um, Borovitz 100, loan no more. The figure of Borovitz is, undoubtedly, an inspiring one. For years, he fought the occupiers, forming a large resistance group and then leaving it with only 100 faithful. After all, it fell increasingly into banditry. He never gave up, and neither will Ukraine, neither will we. There are countless recruits who have cited this story as the reason for their joining and their potential can be nurtured. Each of the 100 are skilled and can turn training these new men. In this way, the legacy of Borovitz will endure and the 100 will grow into many more. Cause for concern if you want to be that, please go ahead. Additives. As occupied territories were liberated, the UNRA forces observed the co collaborators were practically everywhere in the administrations of the region. this too. So many of them were present in such influential positions where a strong argument could be made, at least according to Ola Blin, that they would need be indispensable uh, to the continuity of the government in newly liberated regions and a fundamental part of the new government of the Republic of Ukraine. Zibia was a dismissive of that idea. Rubbish, she said. Uh, these cornerstones of the new Ukraine you praise so highly, although Blin, are a lot of traitors and sellouts and nothing more. We struggle to trust you as it stands, and what is the likelihood there is that these people, many of whom we saw bending over backwards to accommodate cock and the Nazis, will be any less untrustworthy than you? While the Loblin's lot sputtered, others call for a more moderate position on the subject. I grant that the majority of these people are untrustworthy, but surely there are different levels of untrustworthiness. Just like there are different severities of evil. Obviously, a large portion should be dealt with, like we will do with the RKU. But surely we can trust the loyalty of a few of them here or there. And in the end, I've concluded that there are to be no collaborators in the Ukrainian government. A few of them could be permitted to continue their posts. Collaborators should be integrated into the government en masse. Uh, I don't want to hurt our admin efficiency, but we'll do that one anyways, because we can. And there goes our PP. Alright, we're all in. Because we still have our revolutionary inertia. And this expires in two days, so that's not good. So if we, if we can take Kiev in that time... Well... Oh, and there it goes. Alright then. How many couch have we delivered? 33,000. We've lost 7,000 ourselves. Couch have never been a really big part of our losses too much, really. And Kiev is ours. Which is more, more or less. A lot of debate went on in nondescript peasant farmhouse that was the UNRA's temporary headquarters. There was always something to argue about, had never had ever been since the Polician Guard was founded, but the United was especially energetic. The question whether the resistance should prioritize quality or quantity in the fight to liberate Ukraine. On the one side was Zubia and his allies, as Berefet their views on the subject, more of them were arguing for their point. 
The argument was straightforward. The peasant masses hate our enemies as much as we do. Our friend has more holes in it than any opinion Olobun expresses, and a single well-placed strike could destroy the entire army. We need the lines, folks. We should call farmers and other civilians to the front lines and thereby bolster our ranks. Is it not common sense? No way in heck is it common sense, Borovitz, the lone advocate of equality over quantity in the room posted. Fill the line with untrained peasants in the fields with life follows. These farmers die to any disease or accident you can name. And that's before we get to how they'll fail or in battle. No need to create a professional force based on discipline and training. If the UNRA can move faster and better with effort, who cares how many holes there are on the front line? As their arguments became less and less substantive with every retort, the opinion slowly but surely get swung in a given direction, which was, do as Zubia said, prioritizing filling the front line. Do as Borovitz said, keep the true quality strong. Uh, I'm a big quantity, you know, I like both, don't get me wrong. But in the end, if it's quality versus quantity, I gotta go with quality. Generally, not always. But generally. Good. At least we're still enjoying the Olympics here in the world. Got a terrible credit rating, but what do you expose during civil war? They help them out. They're fighting over river, man. They need as much support as possible. UNRA. United and strong. Oh, that's pretty good. Establish war machine. Ooh, growth will increase. Ooh, popular support goes down, though. More, ooh. Ooh, poverty gets better here, too. Send to press with, or replace free press. Interesting. Create officer core. That's pretty good too. I have to alter the offer the alternative. It's not bad. We're gonna go to the Sepsh War Machine. As with other areas, we must formalize the apparatus to stay in order to win this war. Underground work trucks can outfit an, an insurgency, but they cannot outfit an army. And we cannot, uh, for a moment, entertain the possibility of losing access to adequate quantities of weaponry. We must prepare the war economy, organizing and retooling the factories and supply chains needed to operate them. It'll no doubt be an enormous effort, but there is quite possibly none more vital. I'm nice surprised these guys are still alive somehow. That's alright. They won't be alive for very long. How much more? Oh, they got a lot more in them. Alright, whatever. Go all the way. We can outstock. Okay. Hey, we got a port. We got nothing to use it with, though. This is pre and priority. If you want to do this, please go ahead. We must take action now. It's alright. It happens. Person, yes. There we go, I'm Greek boys. Bye, Greek boys. Redecorations. The town square was in a sea of blue and yellow. The UNRA. Soldiers were distributing flags to the people. But the significant contingent of homemade signs and national paraphernalia. Slogans crudely painted on blankets and sheets, German military uniforms torn to ribbons, and the outpouring of emotion was intense and universal, as the day wore on. And the most successful symbols of German occupation were torn down, a sort of game emerged from the ones that were hard to get into. People who found creative ways to rip swastikas down from the tall buildings were rewarded with alcohol and cheers. A huge crowd soon formed under the facade of the town's biggest hotel, which sported a huge Reichsadler in stone. For hours, nobody could figure out how they were going to do it. The most noble, most they were able to do was pour buckets of feces over it from the floors above, although this was stopped after it started splattering the people assembled below. Then a group of young men wandered into the square, carrying a set of spokes from the disassembled plow. Their work was on. The crowd managed to locate some rope and started making huge grappling hooks. Hooks were taken up to the higher floors, wedged into the little nooks between the Reichsadler and the wall. And then the ropes were tossed down into the square below. With a hundred people pull pulling, the Great Wings, or Great Eagle, came down in no time, taking a good portion of the hotel's front wall with it. The Ukrainian people's creative spirit went out. Quiet the grumbling stomachs. As our other preparations continue, we cannot, must not, forget the absolute primacy of ensuring adequate food supplies. A famine would be crushing not only to our military efforts, but also to our legitimacy in the eyes of the Ukrainian people. We will therefore take steps to protect and empower the farmers while expanding supply. Production quotas will be raised, of course, but this will be accompanied by land grants in order to meet those quotas, along with other exemptions, food equipment, and other support. We must have food, and they must grow it. Absolutely. God, I love drinking. Another encirclement. Beautiful. If you can move it even faster, that'd be great.
beautiful. Good. Good. We use a lot of political power. Army cost modifier, harsh penal code replaced with a politicized peanut system. Restore logistics. Get free infrastructure, I like that. The collaborator connections. That's pretty good too, I like that. Deal with the scent. Well, it's UNRA, United and Strong. The Galician divisions of the UNRA benefited immensely from the rugged land in which they operate, protected from the worst of the occupation successes. Borovitz has, over many years, turned into an elite force among the resistance, and its efficacy and ambush is near legendary. Now, as we hope to liberate all of Ukraine, the time is going to fuse the UNRA together more actively, combining our divisions in Galicia and Policia, to form a united front capable of overcoming our rivalry with the UPA and overtaking the Reichs Commissariat at its core. If we wish to unite Ukraine, first we must stand united. That's great. How many cows have we delivered? Over 100,000 dead. For what reason? Seriously, for what reason? You see who's better? You got some real negative growth. Offer the alternative. Create an officer corps. Make volunteers. Ooh, get more political party. Lose population, though. Oh, we're going to create an officer corps. Well, do we shoot? Yeah, we will. A movement needs leadership. Leadership means officers, and we must ensure that we have the cadres needed. Much has been debated on whether to prioritize quality or quantity, and though this decision has not yet been made, we must nonetheless give additional focus to our officer corps. Given more time to train, ensuring that such training is as proper and efficient as possible will serve excellently in the short term. Better plans will be made, but for now, effectiveness can be improved directly, and that will suffice. Hey, look at that. Nice. We have scarce food, that's not good. So how many divisions they got up to 35? They got a lot of divisions, that's not good. We don't have a lot of things here. Exit number 13. Memorandum, transcript of a meeting between UNRA commanders, uh, 1964. Subject, punishment of RK officials. All of them. Now, in the last remaining Wehrmacht forces in Ukraine are defeated, we must accept the punishment for the German officials, and some may not. Let's start with Leibrandt and Ollendorf. Horless. I immediately propose to have sentenced them to death by firing squad for the notorious crimes against Ukraine. All of them. Well, I'm not very fond of this idea. We might have used them for something later, but all in favor? Horless. I can't think of any help that could do for us. Now on over Altagam. All of them. Ah, yes. <clears throat> I honestly believe he shouldn't die, not just for practical reasons, but for more moral ones as well. Out of them all, he was the most loyal to the native people. Populace so would be more just uh, to sense uh, Brabzo come to life in prison, so that Horlis interrupts all of them. No, no, no. He's too important to be left alive. Good or bad, he's still a Nazi. and can't spare him, all of them. Some things are warranted. All of them will leave a point. All in favor of sensing Hans Alto Brabzo come to death by firing squad. All men raise their hands. Deal with dissent. Freedom is an inalienable human right. That being said, should our enemies take advantage of our lack of control to undermine the war effort, none of us will have any freedom at all. There are so many communists, band rights, and unrepentant collaborators running around in our territory. These will need to be rounded up. Furthermore, we must restrict the activities of the press and of the private political associations. Treason minded enemy agents can possess or pose as journalists or activists to solve doubts and discontent between the alliance. We cannot allow this to happen. These measures may not be palatable, but they are necessary if we are to be victorious, of course. Now let's versus the commies. Take as much as you can. Don't make a solid front line. Oh, look at that. You all need to do this. Go. And if you can't break them, well, just unite our lines a little more. That's all. Good. We are using a lot of militia like they are. Yeah, I'm strong. This will help us out too. Deal with dissent. Because I do want to get to collaborator connections. Although it is full to say the least. It cannot be denied that the connections to entry made by Olublin made through his early collaboration are useful to the cause. They can and will. But it must be leveraged if we are to build a strong city, and so shall it be. It will, however, be necessary to prevent present them in a creative fashion and minimize the involvement that Bahazi had in, had in this regard. A sacrifice made for the good of the country, and I figure it deservedly minimized. Quite a small price to pay, indeed. This is war act like it, huh? I'm not sure if I want to do this one, though. I like their store logistics, though. Faustian Bargain. Hmm, don't need to do that one. Spoils. 
Oh, I have to about this one. Please, uh, please go ahead. There is blah 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 bits. Honestly, there is no more beautiful set in the world than a few dead Germans. Even better, a few of dead SS men. Their ambush had worked perfectly. The Nazis had walked right into a brutal uh, enfilade fire that destroyed the unit within minutes. All fun and games until they had to spend hours preparing for the bodies to burn. A soldier rushed up to him, gasping for breath. General, we found a cache, some valuables, furniture, karakari, crap like that, but guns and a lot of them too. Um, when the two arrived at the cache, they found some enterprising soldiers already helping themselves to their findings. One man had a silver fork bristling in his pockets, while another had apparently decided to tote an entire dresser back to camp. Others were checking out the guns, a relatively old consignment of 50s era German weaponry, but uh, was still useful. Borovitz smiled, disappeared instantly, dropped everything he barked, causing the soldiers to whip around in shock. And I mean everything, or I'll have you court martialed for stealing from the Ukrainian people now. With, that much, with much groaning and complaining, the soldiers reluctantly gave up their pickings. The SS stolen goods went into one pile, which would be returned to their owners. The guns were given to those without working weapons or set aside for new recruits. Once the process was over, Borovitz glared at the soldiers began to speak. We are not looters, we're not bandits, we're not thieves, we are soldiers. Fighting for a country. If you think you're here to steal from our people, think again. Bandantry is a German's work, not ours. The assembly was quiet. And Borman is one, it's not good. Not ideal for us, but no matter. We'll still do well. Restore logistics. The trials of war have enacted an enormous toll. Look at that. On the railways crossing the Republic. Well, our both our forces and those of our enemies targeted those held by the other side, and there are now just innumerable disruptions, damage, and destroyed lines, and many other conflicted problems. This must be addressed, and our resources will be required to do so. It will, however, be well worth it. Assisting in troop transport, the delivery of supplies, and of course, the support of civilian sectors as well. Work will begin immediately. If you want to continue reading about all these, please go right ahead. Since this is probably the fastest I've done the Civil War, it was actually very easy. Drop the hammer, win the war. Oh, look at that. Weekly Warspark goes down. Oh, God. Scrounge together what's left. The cure to fascist rot. Of course, this is a war. Act like it. There's a Faustian bargain. The freedom to Ukraine or death. Dropping the hammer, freedom to Ukraine or death. More gain, organization, recovery rate, weekly war support, and stability drop like crazy. Oh, look at this guy. The Black Raven. More political power, division, organization, stability. Oh, liberation. Oh, God. We've accomplished the impossible. We have achieved it for Ukraine. A land free from the ending oppression and imperialism of foreign powers, but the multitude of scars from the decades of imprisonment have not yet healed. Our people hunger for many freedoms and rights, but primarily for the right to eat. They long for bread to be put on the table for the children to no longer starve, to not have, uh, to continue without end on an empty stomach. We must take action against the famine that continues to haunt us. To liberate the people from hunger, a new democratic government must be established with haste. Well, we'll see. I can't believe we start to deal with all this stuff here, too. Uh, let's make some convoys if we have to. Um, we should be okay. I'm not sure if we can get back Crimea, but it would be kind of nice if we could. You guys, there's too many of you all. Be halfway decent, at least. Well, the hammer sickle no more, but we're going to read about no more running. That's him, Officer Yusenko. His arms crossed as he stared at the scruffy young man in the station's jail cell. Despite his age, his face was haggard in a patched beard and shaggy dark hair. It was rail thin, his communist uniform hanging off his bones like the clothes of a scarecrow. He was given a crack on the wall, a heavy lidded stare. That's what I. That's what he said. I always pictured him a bit scary, replied Chief Zelenko. The news treated him like a boogeyman, psychotic, conniving dude cloaked in mystery. Thought he'd be younger, some kid didn't know what he was getting into, added Officer Dudnyek. Um, when I ran with the UNARA, they lionized him. They all wanted to be the man who must cook cock, uh, returned Senku, thought he'd be taller. But Don didn't say anything, even as the cops spoke about him. He instead sat down at one of the cots, listening to the conversation and looking at the policeman. He didn't look afraid or sad or angry. He looked tired and a bit more chattering among themselves. One of them finally acknowledged the prisoner. Well, even turned yourself in, you could have hit easily or kept fighting us. Boldan looked at him in the eye for the first time, his voice hoarse. I've been hiding for years. Killing Germans was the only thing that made the hiding worth it. Now who am I fighting? Ukrainians. I can't do that. You know, they might kill you, said Usenko, and asked Bodan. These were the last words of the night as he fell into the cot and got his first night of good rest in nearly a decade. Not even a nightmare. The Republic of Ukraine is established, though. In the aftermath of the collapse of the Reich's eastern holdings, a light of hope has finally emerged from the dark fog of war. After a months-long civil conflict and the so-called breadbasket of the Reich, the Ukrainian territories are now in the hands of a liberal and democratic partisan group that has begun to sell a new democratic government. Appealing to the people of Ukraine's dreams of a free nation, the now the Republic of Ukraine has won the hearts and minds of the oppressed people of Ukraine, and has since established a sovereign state with the native Ukrainians being the main holders of power within the government. The international community remains skeptical as to what will happen next to the leader of the Republic. Yuri Horlis assures all that Ukraine will remain free. We are finally free, and have more and sickle no more. 
Shim Ski, along with the other five uh, UNRA soldiers guarding him, walked out of the theater building in Rostov, which had miraculously survived through German occupation in the Civil War. Just moments ago, he had signed a formal act of uh, unconditional surrender of the communist forces, and the men now escorting him were witness to, to this, according to the document. All units must seize their operations until disarmament, and Shumsky, along with the most important figures in the Soviet resistance, was allowed to leave Ukraine and move to another neutral country. He didn't try to comfort himself with the thought that it wasn't his fault. He had no interest in fooling himself. He felt responsible for the failure of the communist idea and for letting down all the people who had worked so hard for the reestablishment of Soviet Ukraine. The workers and peasants of Ukraine would never truly be free. The fight was lost his time. The dreams of Marx, Engels, Lenin, and Bukharin would never be realized. His dream would never be realized. Still, Shumsky thought it wasn't all that bad after all. It wasn't the Wehrmacht that extinguished the communist fire, but the somewhat reasonable Horlitz and the UNRA. Deep in his soul, he knew that Horlitz wasn't a bad man. He had just had other ideas, and the fact that the leader of the democratic resistance had agreed to a treaty rather than outright destroying the Soviet partisans was already worthy of respect. It was an honest fight, and a loss in such a fight is a dignified loss. During his inner monologue, Shumsky and the other soldiers passed a flagpole into the theater, and he saw the flag of the Ukrainian SSR being taken down. His only reaction was a deep sigh. Farewell, old soldier. Deliberation. The days of the Civil War have allowed us to make decisions almost automatically now that we have established a republic. We must take a step back to figure out what to do next. The immediate threat of Germany has dissipated for now, leaving the remaining internal threats of a newfound republic to take precedence. Therefore, it is of the utmost importance to quell its dangers if any of the new government is to be able to stand up on its own two legs. Politics at the dinner table. Stus Akilman, you must be joking, Alenia. Vasil Stus is a baby. He was in diapers when the Germans invaded. As if Zubia is some wizen sage, face it. It's an election between children. We must simply pick the best one and support the one who can beat back the Germans. So we scrape the bottom of the barrel for allies? What a low opinion on a great nation. The banter continued as Helena began serving dinner. Since the start of the electoral season, the Nosenko household has been abuzz with these debates, each hawking their own favorite party. Each also helped campaign. For their side, as best they could, Daniel with the reading sessions and Helena with the door to door campaign. As Helena placed Banush on the dinner table, Daniel looked up at her with a delightful smile. How much better he looked now, she thought to herself, active and open after so many years of closing himself tighter and tighter. Even his face, once so tight and particularly concerned, seemed most inexpressive. He was older than ever, but she never seen him so alive. What great days for the both of them. No more debates, Daniel? Let's eat. And maybe drink too. Long shadows. Rodan was a malicious soldier in the UNRA alongside his fellow guerrilla fighters. Uh, skulking amidst the rain swept ruins of the Kiev battlefield. It was only then that he came upon the ruins of an abandoned office complex, one that was used by the old regime where he and his comrades sought to wait outside the storm. It was going to take a while before the civil government could rebuild the devastated urban centers, which was why this entire part of the city looked the way it did. The whole neighborhood was still smoldering from where the fighting had knocked most of it down. On the side of the place was about as dreary as the skies outside, if not for the damp cold than from the refuse lining the hallways. Upturned desk, emptied filing cabinets, scattered papers covering the floor, and every so often a faded swastika banner left fluttering limply on a distant wall, still pinned to the crumbling plaster. Rodan and his comrades made the best of their environment, there was little else to do until the weather got better, anyhow. Some resorted to drinking alcohol, others to play darts using their knives in the cracked portrait of Eric Koch on the wall. An interesting point was when the youngest of them tore one of the Nazi banners from the wall, laying it out on the floor to thrusting it with his pelvis. As Rodan sat back with his feet up on what he assumed to be a head honcho's desk, the smile that had been there for a moment then faded. It struck him that the sheer apparatus it took for the Germans to rule in Ukraine, from Koch all the way down to this now derelict office building. He realized that this place was just one piece of all the Nazis had spent a generation building in Ukraine, as well as a gloomy implication that this is what the new republic would now have to build upon entirely from scratch. A job for grander men than me, and not one to be envied, he thought grimly. Well, we wouldn't be Ukraine without Crimea, so as we're doing deliberation, we're taking them out. But disorganization. We may not be proud to admit it, but there are many areas within Ukraine that do not fully lie within our control. Collaborator mayors of the old regime still hold sway over the cities they once lorded over. Peasants organize their own mob rule. And law within isolated villages and towns, fascists and communist insurgencies have sprung up and attempted to cripple our authority. This cannot be done. The Republic's authority must be respected if we are to become a free nation. We can only do this after establishing a democratic government, and a democratic government cannot be established until elections are held. We must make it our priority. And we still got to deal with all this stuff here, which kind of sucks. But we got to save the political power for reintegrating Crimea at the table, though. The day ended with another dinner eaten in silence. Since the war ended, Peter von Norden had to know how to explain the failure to his family, and Anatonia was too busy to worry about what the Republic might do to them. The families in limbo, their home in the countryside was long gone, and the temporary residences might be taken by the state at any moment. Yet, once Peter dismissed his family, he rushed down to the department's lobby and waited. For a solid half an hour, he not sat and fiddled, praying that both the, that the man would arrive and that would be spared the humiliation of his presence. His first up was granted, and the other squashed. The man arrived shortly after wearing a refitted aug Ukrainian auxiliary, auxiliary uniform, and a grim, he spoke German, but only a stalted German. As the pillar blue and yellow hastily sewn in, this is a Ukrainian man, and some bitter pot of pizza soul mocked his every fleeting kindness, kindness towards the man. This is a creature that ruined your country. 
Still, Peter needed stability and needed safety no matter how far he had away. Small talk was made, money exchanged for protection. The Kirin called the bribe a donation to the Spivators. Peter had no choice but to smile and agree. After the man took his visitor and disappeared, Peter stumbled back to his apartment in shame. Praying to a force he could not define, he thought with pride of the destruction of a German invasion might bring. How these soldiers wipe away this ugly chapter. As we're still going in. Please. Do not stop. The day you stop is the day we all die. Somewhere in somewhere in a village near Chikasi. Two peasants were discussing politics over mugs of beer. One surprisingly different to what was happening in the country to him, the most important things were his family and his farm. His friend, however, was in a staunch support of the culturalist movement. He argued that they only could improve their lives and ease their burden. The former, as usual, didn't care much for his companion's speeches and scoffed at him. However, later that day, he wondered maybe the culturists weren't so bad after all. Somewhere in Kiev. A packed bar resonated with the, mobile, the public eagerly catching every word coming out of Vasil's to his mouth. He spoke emotionally of all the crimes committed by Germany against Ukraine, successfully appealing on behalf of everyone's friends and relatives lost due to the Reich's cruelty. He brilliantly ended his speech with a call for all of Europe to unite against Nazism and causing the audience to roar in approval. Somewhere in a country house in Pilatsirka, Olo Bloom was hosting a dinner with a high-ranking collaborationist officials. During the meeting, many concerns were expressed, mainly for the safety for the militias of the United Friends and Culturists, along with the fears of the inevitable German reaction to the fall of the rule over its calling. Olo Bloom was so used to these complaints that he stayed quiet throughout the whole hour or two of discussions. Nevertheless, he understood that their concerns were valid, and his mom was already trying to find solutions to these problems. After the dinner was over, and all the guests had left, Olo Bloom, still pondering a solution to the nation's trouble, made an inward resolve he would keep Ukraine safe no matter the cost. The many faces of Ukraine's political life. Spivator Salvation, Alexander Olobin will lead Ukraine to a new golden age of collaboration and prosperity. Versus, Glory to Ukraine, Ivan Zubia will lead Ukraine to a new golden age of democracy and socialism. Versus, Unity and Struggle, Vasil Stus and Taras Balabobovic will lead Ukraine to a new golden age of freedom and security. Well, we're going to read about Wrong Turn first. Ah. And we're going to integrate Crimea. And then we'll see from there. <coughs> um... Just look at reserves, huh? Well, I want to keep populist and everything else pretty high overall. Socialism, stability, social popularity. Well, we can wait, I guess. Technically, control of the Republic of Ukraine increases, huh? Let me go with that one for now. Do that. It's going to really worsen it, and growth gets us slightly better, but still. It's not great. Can we get rid of the Transnist 3 government? I personally would like that the most. Ah, oh, the Slodoban's uh, car bounced and banged along the far flung dirt road to the Ukrainian heart and lands, carrying the mid level government bureaucrat to his new residence, a small town on the edge of the Black Sea in need of government assistance and reconstruction. It was here that the smell first appeared, and the piercing, pestilential stench that crept up through the car. Something drew his eyes from beyond the windows of his car, enough to bring the vehicle to an abrupt stop. Slobodan felt his jaw clench and his heart jump into his throat when he saw them. He should have just kept driving, but what he saw was too much to ignore. Slobodan forced himself to swallow as he got out of the car, the door jar as he stood there, reeling. The rope still gripped around their necks, their pruned bodies drifting in the wind down a makeshift gallows. And an execution of very public one at that, even out here in the wall, was close to the middle of nowhere as one could get. The elements had long eaten away the wood planks slung over the shoulders, including the etchings detail in the crimes, the identity of both crime and criminal forever lost in the distant wilderness. Slobodan couldn't take out any insignias anywhere of any kind, not a swastika or a cross tamar and sickle to be found anywhere. It could just as easily have been the Nazis lynching militiamen of the Red Army as it could have been the other way around, and for all who knew it could have been a peasant dispute against the latter landlords gone horribly medieval. The sickening nature of what lay before him weighed on him. The pain of what the Germans had done to this country could not be as easily forgotten as these people clearly were. It would be a long road to travel before the hordes of what went on here could be laid to rest. The time could only heal so much, but we're going to end it there, because in the next few episodes we're going to each go through every single one of these uh, elections to see they're different, and see what comes of them. But if you enjoyed the video, please consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow to see what path we're going to take next for the Republic of Ukraine. Thanks for watching, have a great rest of your day.